So this is cool, but as I told you, we need to, yeah, we have time. So the, 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 the big question, as I told you, is once we're dealing with machine learning, we, have, we, we usually have large data sets. And the fully visible machines, they're beautiful, but we have small devices. The fact that they're not connected, 46 variables go to 1,000 variables. So there is usually a lot of resources that you need. Images usually are not seven by six, you have thousands of pixels. So how do you overcome this, this problem of having even continuous variables? So let's say if you don't have access to a continuous quantum computer, how do you even overcome the, those issues? The, the fact that the, the, the data sets are large in, in dimensionality, not just actually in size, or how many samples you have, actually they have a lot of variables, and the fact that they could be continued. And this is precisely actually the idea behind this last paper. And it's, it's, it's very preliminary results, but we just want to convey an idea how to move in that direction, because I think that's an important question to address. Notice now my, my quantum box, my quantum speed up box, or potential quantum speed up box now goes here. And the reason is because at the end of the day, in some way, I'm having a quantum representation of the data indirectly with the trick that I'm about to show you without actually resorting to having a quantum memory or anything like that. So basically the idea is, is I, was, I was actually bugging Marcello and John for, for many years, saying, it's, it's an observation that I had is, in deep learning, usually what you do is you have, you have a deep network like this one, it goes for many layers, as I told you, for Google's face recognition, it's 150,000 layers of this, and tons of variables, many billions of neurons, so it's, it's crazy. But at the end of the day, as I show you, every single time you kind of like shrink, and even in the, in the maybe 1996 paper by Jeff Hinton, science paper, basically when you, when you propose this Bayesian network, this deep, deep belief networks that they call, you're doing literally two things. You could be doing the classification, but at the same thing, you actually you can think of this as like the compression of the data. Because in reality, when you start here with a visible space, it could be 1,000 pixels, you end up with a much more reduced space that they call the latent space. And you can even do optimization in that latent space, and it's really cool, actually. You can use the representation of the data, so every single data point here is gonna be represented in this smaller space. The observation is the following. Usually data could be coming like gray, gray image pixels. I mean, continuous variables. And that, of course, I mean, is not affected by, by classical machine learning. But the beautiful thing is, in reality, in the primitive versions of deep learning, these guys are actually discrete, binary, they're neurons, and at the end of the day, you end up with a smaller space. So the question, I mean, what I told Marcel Langeon is what could be even better for a quantum device? If you could actually just attach a quantum device here on top, at this, at this representation that is binarized, you overcome two issues. The fact that the data goes from continuous to discrete, to bits, and then you will become an actually working in a much smaller space. Now you can start with a thousand, a data set with a thousand variables and maybe you can be working with 50 qubits. Actually, the example in, in the science paper by Jeff Hinton, I think it was thousand variables here and then it was 60, the last layer. So that's the best of both worlds for a quantum device. What was tricky and what it took us several years to even come up with the first proposal is, it's not easy actually to put kind of like this quantum computer in the loop and actually assist in the whole process. That was until, uh, Marcello found this paper again, another model that doesn't exist anymore, or actually they keep doing refinements but very slowly, is this concept of this Helmholtz machine. Helmholtz machines are really are the grandfathers of what is now called machine learning, the variational of the encoders, or the GANs, or the, uh, as well like GANs, like these models. So what you do, what you have actually to make a generative model is you have two networks, and it's kind of like a game, they're competing. So you have one network, that you have the raw data, and it's doing inference. So this is what they call inference, actually, it's reducing the, the, the dimensionality to the point that maybe you can have some classes here if you want. And then what they use is, without the quantum device, basically, is you have that representation and you use that information, you sample from this distribution here, for images that are generated here, it, they actually, they call this algorithm to train this, they call this, uh, the wake sleep algorithm. Because basically they think actually this is kind of like a dreaming phase. They think of this as a brain. And basically here is kind of like a distorted space of dreams. It's just bits that they don't look like anything. 
But the idea is that if you take those dreams, this representation, and you sample back, by the way, here it should be a directed network. So it's actually, the information is coming down, and the arrows go like this. So it's, it's different from what we've been doing. But basically, you take the dreams, and then you can use to train this, and basically you generate some images. At the beginning of the training, the images are not going to look the same. I mean, they're going to actually look completely random, or maybe distorted things. And the idea of the game is, can I actually match something that looks like the data? And then I start refining this. So the wake sleep algorithm, what it's doing, is refining the weights in this network and in that network in such a way that I can, at the end of the day, the two models actually, I cannot distinguish between the data and the images that were generated. And then I'm happy because now I can use the network just to, the whole network to generate new images. So now, how do I put a quantum device in the middle? And is it actually to work here? And wh why would it be even useful? So a couple of things is, is if you put a quantum device, then the models that you could have here, they're different. They're not just actually Boltzmann or they're not restricted to this type of model. So it's an interesting proposal. The second thing is because maybe the quantum device can only work at this representation. We actually, we did an experiment on this. Oh, yeah, once you train the network, of course, you can do the task that I told you. You can have a corrupted image and at the end of the day end up with a reconstructed image. Because the information goes like this and they flow this way. Now the experiment that we did actually was leveraging on the, in the PRX paper, the one that I show you in the physical Boltzmann machine. So basically here is the, the data. Notice here that I just don't have, again, and this is a demonstration, instead of having a seven by six, that is very poor men uh, representation, now I have, I think, of the order of 256 much more than I can actually embed in the, in the device. By this time, actually, we already had the device with 2,000 qubits, so we had more capabilities. So instead of having 46 here, we decided to go all full-blown. One thing here, remember, the only reason why computer scientists not, don't have more links is because then the problem becomes intractable. That's why you need RBNs, because you clamp and then everything gets dissociated. But they wish they could have more links. So one thing that actually you can do with these quantum models is you can say, okay, I can afford Boltzmann samples, or I can afford a fully connected model here because I have a device where I can sample. So I don't care, I can actually connect these units here in the top. That's an advantage, for example, for the presentability. Now, remember what I told you? So basically everything is classical, and you go from this layer, you go to the top. The top layer is 60 variables, and the reason is because 60 is the number of fully connected variables that you can get into 2,000 devices. And it takes you about 1644 qubits. So it's a, it's a very large experiment. So it's the spaghetti, but kind of like twice the size of what I show you. And then we just use this, this stuff that we, that, that we did in the PRX. That's basically for each data point. We have a representation now in the, in the, in the, in the D-Way device, represented by this 1644 qubits that in reality is only 60 variables. And then at the end of the day, as the model is being trained and these weights are being updated, the H's and JIJ's are also being updated here to be able to match the data. So what we did really at this stage is imagine that my seven by six digits now live here in this space. And then basically you're training the D-way to generate the dream, the dream, uh, the dream phase, kind of like the, this abstract representation of the data. And as you train that, the next phase is if I sample from from this dreamy state with the device, whatever it learned after many, many iterations, how do the samples look like when I actually post-process them? So here we take samples from the quantum device in the, in, the, in the space of this 1644 qubits that we can map to 60, 60 bits, propagate the information, and that will be images that will be generated. So again, we have good and bad news. So here is actually, images that were coming directly from the device. So the training, I mean, is, is quite poor. I mean, actually, what you see here, you can have something that looks like, again, coming from the device, I mean, coming from these 1644 six, qubits, mapped to 60 through the majority voting, processed through the network, and then boom, you get this. Not, no more, nothing else. So basically, it's that the dreams of the D-Wave coming into real life, into, into, into numbers. And you see, I mean, there's a bunch of zeros, like it looks like then it's a number six, a number eight, a number seven, 
number three, number two. So there is a, there is a very cool thing. So although the images are very blurry, one of the main challenges of GANs, or generative adversarial networks, that is these guys, is that actually, when you have generative models, you can easily get trapped in, in, in when you have a multimodal distribution, you can easily get trapped in local modes. And for example, when you train a machine like this, it will most likely get you only number ones and number twos. It doesn't give you actually the whole range of numbers. So it was actually good that in principle the multimodality it was seen. We, we had something actually, the images here are images directly from the data set that was fed to the device, but the closest one in humming distance to the images that were generated. So for example, as you can see, this looks like a zero. This is the closest. Yeah, for example, the ones that are here, I think he was actually took it as a, the closest, this, this was more like an, I thought it was an eight, but it's a zero. This is a number seven, so etc. So the nice thing is that we, it looks like we were generating many modes, that's good. The bad news is that the quality is quite bad, as you can see. But there was actually also good news. And it's precisely the reason why everybody dropped this in the, in the, in the 90s, in the, in the early 2000s, is it's really hard to train these models. And the good news is that if we do the entirely classical training with the no DW being involved, you get actually similar results. You actually get crappy results. So the explanation there is actually is that the, the reason why we get crappy results is, be, is because we are using this 1995 code, of wake sleep algorithm, that is the only one that we could adapt to the quantum device, but that gives very suboptimal results. As I mentioned, up to 2017, there was a paper training, quant training Helmholtz machines, but they do it very, very sophisticated techniques that actually there's no way, at least I could see trivially, how to use the quantum dynamics to actually adapt the classical model to the quantum one. So in principle, there is a lot of things to do here, but this is just kind of like, as I said, to inspire ideas of how to solve these problems. I notice that there is a change of paradigm here. Throughout the talks, we've been talking about quantum computers and system deep, deep learning. No? We've been talking about how can we speed up deep learning. Here is the opposite. How machine learning can actually assist the processes of a quantum device. Because by my, using machine learning techniques, I can change the representation of the data. And then hopefully, the quantum computer in itself being in the middle, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to enhance the model itself. So it will be actually a back and forth between the, the two classical and machine learning and quantum machine learning. I think with that pretty much, uh, that's the end of my talk and my whole sessions. So with this part of the, I just wanted to acknowledge kind of like some of the funding institutions. Most of the work that I presented in quantum manilin today, at least this quantum machine learning, was John Rialpe, who was a research scientist, and Marcello, who as I mentioned, was about to graduate. Uh, that's mostly kind of like the technical side. The, I hope, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure it was lots and lots of information throughout the three lectures. We went over gate based, machine learning, quantum annealing. I tried to cover something that is uh, self-contained, but, uh, but I'm pretty sure you will find a lot of material in the references. And please feel free to email me. I think I put here my email. I, I think I will share the slides also with the organizers. And, um, and yeah, so I, I hope, I mean, some of you decide actually to jump with us um, and actually continue working on this. How can we do with these quantum devices, with quantum mechanics, in this more like quantum engineering context for application? So thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you very much, Alejandro. Do we have questions for Alejandro? Hello, uh, how do you do feature engineering in quantum ML models? Yes, well, actually what, maybe for the ones who are familiar with, uh, uh, with machine learning, is one of the things that come for free when you're training a deep neural network is usually from the visible layer, you start with a lot of uh, visible units. And then basically as you start moving up the ladder, you start getting what, 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 uh, what he's calling features. And basically feature is because, for example, if you're processing, processing image of faces, what you will see actually is that maybe in the first layer you start seeing kind of like the edges of the face. And maybe when you move up, you start seeing something that looks like noses in this, in this Latin space representation. That's why they call this the feature space or just kind of like the light latent space. Uh, to be honest, so the, it, depends, it depends how you go, for example, in, in 
you can always use, uh, but there are proposals for actually using, I mean, this is just an example of feature transformation. There is something that is called kernels, that you take the data, and you also do mathematical transformations to turn the data into something else, similar to what I presented here, but just simple Gaussian transformations. And the data now, it is, this is called a kernel. So all of these proposals, uh, there are proposals actually to, to, to implement actually quantum transformations of, using the Hilbert space itself to have different representations of the data itself. So actually this is what they call like uh, features in, in quantum Hilbert space. So that's one way. That has been presented mostly in supervised learning, but I believe, as I told you, and that's, that's one of the reasons why I stay away from supervised learning, I think this week just came out a paper saying that actually there's no advantage of using Hilbert space for that particular application, for that particular supervised learning, because I mean, that, that was my intuition, because I mean, they're much, much easier task. So, but that, that's one, one direction that you can take a look. There are papers, there were, there were a couple of papers, one PRL and one Nature Physics. You can look by features in quantum Hilbert space and you will find the, the reference. Uh, the other way, as I told you, is maybe exploiting directly. May, I mean, if you start increasing the size of your quantum device, your coverage, in some way, the features already live in the quantum brain. So actually, and, and as I explained, the probabilistic models that you can have from a quantum device is different from, is, is sometimes disjoint from where you can get, uh, there, are, there are some spaces where actually the quantum device is different from the classical model. i just give you an example here. With a classical model, I can only have fully disconnected units here. I can, I can just connect them in my quantum device, for example. And that will give you a, a, a representation, and that's, that's already kind of like working with the features directly, and not with the visible data, with the raw data. So those are maybe two, two examples. Uh, yeah, but take a look also at this paper, uh, I think, that just came out, uh, I think, on, on, this, on this topic. Do we have more questions? Uh, do you ever have an issue with overtraining the, 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 the quantum machine? Like, if you train it too much, instead of creating data, they're just going to reproduce the data you gave them or something like that? No, I think usually what happens is, I mean, in, in any of this training, I mean, when you're doing this, um, when you're training these models, usually the more you go, the better. But actually, sometimes when, when the machine learning, what they see is that when you plateau, basically you just restart because basically most likely, most of the time, you're never gonna hit the global optimum. So most likely you're gonna hit the local minimum. And then, as I showed you in the, in the previous talk with the stochastic solvers, the gradient-free solvers, the more you restart, the more the chances actually you land in different local minimum. So sometimes, I mean, over training, most likely you're gonna see that the course just plateau. And, and then that's, I mean, you have a high, actually, one thing actually that they do, much is, is you reduce the learning rate as the process is going. So it's very, the chances of you jumping to a completely different place is actually smaller and smaller. Because you don't want to take, be taking larger steps. Kind of like in the Newton optimization, you, you kind of like, you, there is a lot of adaptive learning rate, so you work efficiently. So it's very rare to see overtraining. Um, yeah, so that's uh, one. I thought maybe, oh, do you mean overtraining? Because that's another concept that is called overfitting that is crucial in machine learning. That's, that's actually when the, you have too many parameters that you adjust the data too much. You fit the distributions so much to look like your data, but actually when you try to generalize and generate new data, it actually is not, it's, it's pretty much, a, a, it's kind of like if you have a polynomial and if you have, you can adjust the degree of the polynomial to go over all the points, so that's overfitting. But it's not necessarily the model. Maybe a quadratic model does the job pretty well, and that's the, actually the real model. So, so all of these aspects, um, uh, they are just uh, design aspects of the network or the machine learning algorithm, how many parameters you use, how many layers you use. But yeah, so those are things that certainly need to be taken into account. But overtraining, not really, I would say, is you always plateau and that's it. You're dead, then it's time to go back or just ha be happy with what you got. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. so long. And what about the quality of the data for training? Can you have something like confiability that a sample is more com confiable, more trustable, and some other data you are not completely sure if it's really good, but you want to use it for training, but with some grain of salt? 
Yeah, there are, there are always as well like some statistical tests. Uh, I mean, to see actually if it is an outlier, in particular in time series, or uh, if actually the data don't belong. It is very, very common actually in machine learning as well to have noisy data. And actually that's why these probabilistic models are great. Actually, when we have deterministic models, really data is always noisy as well. So that, 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 that kind of like shakes as well. And that's why having this probability distribution is kind of like a better description of the, of the model. So, so in data and overall, I think data, the more, more is always better. And, uh, and in particular, yeah, so these machine learning techniques, in particular the supervised learning, one of the problems is that they are very, very data hungry. So the 60,000 points that I told you is basically is, it's nothing, so they, they really want to have more and, and uh, it's always actually an issue of, and that's why I see actually quantum computing could be promising. This is what is called in machine learning statistical efficiency, is that can you train a model or a model that with less data still does the job or a better job than a, than a different co comparison. So that's actually deep learning are known for being very, very, very inefficient statistically. They require a lot, a lot of data. That's why actually Deep learning, that's one of the reasons we only saw the success uh, now in the 2000s. It's because actually tons of data and actually tons of computational resources. So that kicked uh, that. But yeah, for the question about outliers, I mean, it, there are some techniques that you can spot things to see if it is out of the, re out of the regime, but, but I think you can take it as noisy data. Hopefully the learning algorithm also spot that. That actually is that. I mean, with, with the qubit, you see it. Like, I mean, like the data that we are taking, that actually sometimes have random flips and everything. So you have to deal with that and hopefully on average you correct that or the, the model understand that as well, that it doesn't belong and kind of like ignore that one. More questions? So let us thank uh, Alejandro again.